Our passage for this morning comes from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. As I alluded to earlier, this is a, a dark passage. And when I was looking to prepare uh, scripture, which scripture were, uh, I would use for the sermon from the lectionary, I realized I'd, I'd never preached on this sermon. In 30 plus years, I have never preached a sermon on this passage. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and some of it is because I'm cowardly. It's a terrifying passage. And I don't know that I've always uh, had the courage to to have the faith that a congregation uh, would be ready for it. But these are different times. There's just so much that we have had to look squarely in the eye. In these times now, we have to look ourselves in the eye. We have to look at our traditions, at our policies in this country, and we have to look at our scripture as well. We can do this because we have the faith that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So put on your crash helmet, buckle up, here we go. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Let me emphasize that again. The, the author of Genesis is very clear here. He wants you to know the relationship between Abraham and Isaac and what God will ask Abraham to do, what it means to emphasize it. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he, he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand took the knife and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy <clears throat> or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thine sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before we go any further, can we just take a moment and let the full horror of this passage sink in? <clears throat> 
It's almost obscene. No, it is obscene. God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. The God of love tells Abraham to build a fire, bind his beloved child. And let's be clear here. The the word in Hebrew used here is the technical term for what you do to an animal. To keep it still so that you can slit its throat for the burnt offering. The God of love tells Abraham to build a fire, bind his beloved son, slaughter his beloved son, and then throw the corpse on the fire so that the odor of the burning flesh might rise up to the heavens and please the most high God. We are told up front that this is only a test. And indeed, at the last minute, God does stop Abraham and provides a ram for the sacrifice in Isaac's stead. But that hardly mitigates the obscenity of God's demand, does it? Even if it were only a test, what kind of God would put the faithful to a test so horrific? Now, there is a cultural explanation that helps us to understand just what is going on here. But before we get to that, we need to note just how the text itself emphasizes the horror of this passage. It's relentless. Again and again, excuse me, we're reminded that Abraham is Isaac's father and that Isaac is Abraham's son. Pause there a moment and just think about how you love your children. Think about how you love your grandchildren. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son, Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife so that the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And then later, at the most critical point, we are reminded again, then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that the horror of this test is the point of this story. Indeed, the Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard wrote an entire book on this passage, giving it the cheery title, Fear and Trembling, making exactly this point. He wanted, among other things, to disturb his fellow Christians, who he believed had become too comfy and complacent, complacent in the state church of Denmark mistaking social conformity for the actual requirements of faith, the very faith in which Jesus calls us to turn our backs on our families and take up our own crosses and follow him. Indeed, Kierkegaard intentionally emphasized the horror of this passage to offend his neighbors and shock them out of their slumber to make them clutch their pearls that they might see the radical transformation that God was requiring and indeed promising to affect in believers. Behold, whoever is in Christ Jesus, there is a new creation. The gospel is serious business. In any case, as I alluded to earlier, this story must be understood in its cultural context. Scholars classify it as an etiolog- as etiological, which is a fancy word for a story that explains how things got to be the way they are. Child sacrifice was common among the various peoples in the ancient Near East. There's even some evidence that child fac- sacrifice at one point was practiced in ancient Hebrew religion itself. Our story for this morning was designed to explain why Israel didn't or no longer did, practice child sacrifice in contrast to their neighbors. Seen through this narrow lens, it becomes clear that at least in this context, 
God is being revealed to be remarkably compassionate, accepting animal sacrifice in place of human sacrifice, unlike so many other barbaric and more demanding gods. Now, it's important to here to remember that the stories in the book of Genesis have their roots in prehistory. They come from the Bronze, Bronze Age and circulated orally for centuries before they were codified in what we now know as the Old Testament. Our passage for this morning brings with it the scent of a time so remote that it can be hardly imagined. The ways of that world are not the ways of this world. Indeed, the ways of that world weren't even the ways of the world in which they were first written down. What the book of Genesis represents is a weaving of stories and traditions from time immemorial into a relatively coherent narrative that tells the story of God's relationship with the children of Israel. Indeed, the book of Genesis in its final form comes from the time of the return of the exiles from Babylon a time when the people needed a common narrative to give them an identity or solidify an identity after their earlier identity had been shattered by the first destruction of the temple and the exile. In this light, our story emerges <clears throat> as part of a long meditation on what it means to hope and to keep hope alive when that which is hoped for is deferred again and again. Our passage begins, after these things, these things specifically are God's seemingly impossible promise to Abraham to make of him the ancestor of a great nation when he was already a hundred years old and his wife, Sarah, was similarly aged and long past the child bearing the years. In fact, the child was named Isaac Yitzchak, which means he laughs or laughter, precisely because both Abraham and Sarah laughed when they were given this manifestly absurd promise. And yet they chose to believe. They staked it all on laughter, on hope, on life. They chose to believe even when the promise was deferred again and again. Indeed, Abraham and Sarah wandered for years trying to hold on to this hope, even at one point forcing a surrogate to have Abraham's child in an effort to force the fulfillment of God's promise with markedly horrific consequences. And then when hope finally came to fruition, when Sarah finally, after years, got pregnant and actually bore the promise in her very womb, giving birth to this promise, they were told to kill it, to kill laughter, to smother the hope within them, to willingly give it all up and still trust in God, still trust that the universe is a beneficent place. He can feel the heat of the flames of Jerusalem. He can hear the screams. He can feel the horror of the destruction of the temple in this national narrative of identity. He can hear the cries of the children. He can taste the darkness just how painful it is to witness to the light that is not overcome in the darkness when you yourself can no longer see that light. That is faith indeed. It is not surprising that our early Christian ancestors <clears throat> saw in the story a foreshadowing of the cross of God's sacrifice of his own son amidst the horror of state-sanctioned violence at the hands of the Romans. The significance of the ram could only be fully grasped after Abraham paradoxically gave up hope in the name of hope. 
The resurrection could only happen after Jesus was handed over to the Romans. After he died the death of a criminal, after his mission had failed. And then he was quickly executed in the most horrific manner possible. The Buddhists have a saying, when you reach the further shore, burn the raft. With the understanding that the eightfold path of Buddhism was just a vehicle to get to where you wanted to be and not an end in itself. To burn, to burn the raft is to finally and utterly let go of it all, even of the raft. That the raft itself might not become just one more unhealthy attachment keeping you from the freedom you seek. Here's the point. As Soren Kierkegaard well knew, it is possible to make an idol out of our faith, out of all the promises given to us. It is possible to cling to the outer while mistaking it for the inner, to cling to the world while confusing it with the spiritual. We live in the myth of uh, American exceptionalism with the idea that uh, somehow we are different, that we have a higher caller, calling, a higher mission. And it is truly easy to mistake those ideals for our own foreign policy or domestic policy, to mix up the two so that uh, Christianity itself becomes an authority, a sanction for what mere human beings propose to do. Indeed, it is possible to cling to the outer while mistaking it for the inner, to cling to the worldly while confusing it with the spiritual. It is possible to make an idol out of our piety, as surely as a photo op in front of a church with a Bible after having given the order to gas peaceful protesters. Perhaps in the end, the horror of this story is truly necessary to grasp the true nature of the miracle of resurrection, the miracle of the light that shines even in the darkness, even in the horror, and the radical trust that is being born in us. The transformative power, the ability to let go of all that keeps us from our spiritual resurrection, even when it is unspeakably painful, especially when it is unspeakably painful, even now, in these dark times. Behold, the light shines in the darkness and was not overcome. Amen.